Well, hello everyone. My name is Maria Stafferfenny. I am a certified master kitchen and bath designer and a certified living in place professional. And today we are here on this fabulous webinar to talk about designing for independence and dignity, but without talking about it. I would like to thank our host, our friends at 2020. Thank you so much for hosting this today and being so absolutely fabulous. A big thank you to them. Secondly, we all know how important education is and being here, you will not only learn to become uh, more fabulous, it's that you will also receive CEU credits. So for those people that are looking for the CEU credits, please do know that you have to um, self-report on the NKBA website. We do have objectives today and it always helps to know what our notes are. So today we're gonna understand the need for better design and products, differentiate between disabilities and aging, examine the importance of collaborative teams for accessibility, uh, health and safety. We're going to discuss designs and product ideas that will hopefully rock your client's world and determine how to sell the job. So let's get started right on our first objective, which is understanding the need for better designs and products. We know that falls are a problem. Globally, and all these statistics do come from the CDC, Globally, in April 2021, indicate that 684,000 people die each year from fatal falls. Now, that is absolutely frightening with that. And the fact that in 19 years, the death from falls has increased 53%. These are all reinforcers of why we need to fix this. Now, if we can see the falls and the tip overs, things that we see in our daily lives, um, we know that proper building design and modification practices in all homes are going to meet the needs of everyone, regardless of their current or future needs and regardless of their age. So designing this is very important, especially to you all who are the indirect influencers to that consumer in what they put in their home and why they put it in our home. So I'm going to give you a couple of reasons to back this all up because some people are like, you know what, I understand it and I get it, but I want to know the facts. So here we go. According to the World Health Organization in 2021, accidental injury due to falls is the second leading cause of death. We also know that falls can happen to anyone at any age. And the average cost for a single fall in the United States is over $35,000. Again, that's direct costs. 37.3 million falls required medical attention worldwide in 2021. That's an awful lot of falls. 36 million older adults fall, um, had fall injuries, and that was reported in 2018, and that's the newest data that we have on that. But each year, children ages 0 to 19, 2.8 million children are injured each year due to falls. And healthcare spending, you know how they always say, follow the almighty dollar. Healthcare spending in the U.S. for falls is approximately 68 billion with a B dollars per year. Now who falls? We've all seen the commercial of, oh my goodness, I've fallen and I can't get up. And we get it and we laugh about it. But one in four seniors actually do fall every year. And why do we know that only half report having a fall? Because they don't want people to know they are embarrassed. They don't want people to know that they've had a fall. 72.8% of all these falls happen at home, and 30% of these individuals are hospitalized. Every 13 seconds, an older adult goes to the emergency room as a result of a fall. And children ages 19 and under have 8,000 emergency room visits every single day. 
child safety needs. You see those tether straps? Please make sure that your clients use them. If you're doing their installation, make sure that you do it for them and tell the story of someone you know. I don't care if you have to make it up because this is how you're gonna do this and convince people without talking about it. You're going to tell stories. That's going to be the whole thing. Story, story, stories. Make them up if you absolutely have to. Medical costs for falls, for fatal falls, is $754 million annually. This does not include indirect costs like lost pay, home modifications, the fact that you need to take off of work to bring someone to a doctor or to therapy. None of those costs are included. $754 million for costs and fall. Now, non-fatal falls among the elderly, 50 billion with a B dollars each year, where Medicare only pays 29 billion. So 12 billion plus by private insurers or out of pocket expenses. It makes sense as influencers for your clients that you make the best decisions that you can to keep those clients safe. Evidence from our Canadian friends indicate that the implementation implementation of effective prevention strategies would create number A, a 20% reduction in the incidence of these, and number two, a net savings of over 120 million US dollars each year. So let's give another, let's talk about the differentiation between abilities and aging disabilities and agents and common misunderstandings. Everybody thinks, oh, well, only people with disabilities are older adults. Well, we know that that's not true. And we only need to fix homes for those people that have disabilities. And then the last one, of course, is it's never gonna happen to me. Well, Americans with disabilities, there's so many people that we don't realize have a disability because not every disability is visible. You've watched that person park in a handicapped spot and you wonder if you're being judgy because you don't see that they have some kind of a disability. We know that there's something going on. Um, do people who wear eyeglasses perceive themselves as having a disability? I'm not sure, but why don't you ask them when they take their glasses off? Then they'll tell you that there's an issue because they can't read anything. They can't see anything. That's labels on anything. 61 million adults in the US live with a disability and that's about a quarter of the population. And over 3 million children up to 18 live with a disability. So that's why this becomes just so important because the focus is always about wheelchair, wheelchair, wheelchair but only 1% of the population is actually in a wheelchair, but even more, more than double that, use an assistive device of some kind, whether it's a walker or a cane or something else. And those mobility assistive devices also require space. Think about the scooters or crutches. If you've ever had even a temporary, like a sprained ankle or you pulled a hamstring, something like that, you know how miserable it can be. 75% <clears throat> of wheelchair uh, are unable, of these people using a wheelchair are unable to walk a quarter of a mile. Several people in a wheelchair are definitely have some mobility. They can transfer out of the wheelchair. Not everyone can, but most can. And yet 50% of these people have a step at the entrance of their home. Just doesn't make sense, does it? 33% of mobility users need assistance from a caregiver to perform activities of daily living. Well, what are those? Those are things like um, getting out of bed, getting dressed by yourself, washing your face, brushing your teeth, feeding yourself, um, toileting. All of those things are activities of daily living. And if you cannot do them by yourself, then you require the assistance of another person. And guess what? That also requires space. 
Well, this is not new. We've known all of these things, and we're going to learn about why we make up these stories a little more as we go along. But let's just take a, a dive back into history on why this happened. Everybody knows the name Ron Mace because he was the first person that used the term universal design in 1985. And in 1997, universal design concepts actually got written, but they were really late to the party. They were not the first people to do that. If we actually go back a little bit farther, Selwyn Goldsmith, this guy was an architect that was bound to a wheelchair. And he wrote the book, Designing for the Disabled in 1963, and it became the Bible for architects or disabilities for years. He actually wanted to have the title Architectural Design Criteria for People with Physical Disabilities Who Are Handicapped by Buildings. Uh, but he thought that was just a little bit cumbersome. I think we all think so. His concept was that disabled people are not different from so-called normal people and that buildings that permit them to operate effectively would also be better for everyone else. His work actually came about due to a little known publication from the American Standards Association in 1961 that all of you know about. It's called A117.1 entitled Making Building and Facilities Accessible to and Usable by the physically handicapped. Universal design was great. It was an awesome step. And people looked at it, but it wasn't really simple or intuitive, um, a set of principles. It was a destination, but it really didn't show you how to get there. It wasn't specific to a person's needs. And it often got compared to ADA or you know what was institutional, not residential, and it definitely was not personal. And so like all good design, this continued to evolve. And then we all saw aging in place. Well, aging in place was great, but again, that was only for older people. It didn't really fix any long-term problems. And we all know that in our industry, aging in place had a negative perception by all older adults. And that's why so many design professionals, when they try to incorporate things like grab bars and, and non-slip flooring were met with resistance by their customer who was like, I don't need that. I don't need that. I'm not getting old. And especially if you're dealing with baby boomers, because um, <clears throat> speaking as one, we never get old. We're timeless. <laughs> All right, enough of the jokes. But <laughs> these people never fully accepted that aging in place. So it really wasn't enough. And it met with a lot of objections. So again, what we did was we, like all good design, evolved it again. And now we're looking at a new direction, a standardized program, comprehensive, intuitive, how key, personal and customizable. And it includes everyone. It, it's inclusive of universal design and beyond and aging in place and beyond. And we are now talking about the fact that not everyone can be an expert in everything. So it is a collaboration between professional experts. Now, this new direction has become consumer and industry approved. So tell those stories. Again, when you want to put a grab bar in that bathroom, it's not because they're going to get old. It's because because, well, everybody does this, and this is just a normal accessory for a bathroom now, just like a toilet paper holder and a towel bar. You have a grab bar. It's just a normal thing. In fact, if you're doing a bathroom, my recommendation on a personal level, replace every towel bar with a grab bar so they do have the ability to grab it should they ever need to because you never know when an emergency will come. Now let's talk about these collaborative teams. If you have questions, by the way, just pop them into the chat or pop them into the questions field and our friends at 2020 will help me make sure that we get to see those and answer all the questions. Interprofessional teams, because again, who has all the answers? You can't be everything to everybody and no one can have all those licenses and certifications. Well, I guess you can, but do you really want to diversify that much? We all say that we do the very best for our clients, but if we're not bringing in all the best experts, are we really doing it so that we have a safe and healthy home? Each member of our team has specific experience and we need to make sure that we collaborate professionally so that we can do the accessibility, the health 
and the safety, make sure that those are all the correct things in our client's home. How to do it without talking? Tell a story, make it up if you have to, but it's so important. If you need help making up those stories, you contact me, my information's on that last slide, and I will help you make up those stories so that we can get our clients very accepting of homes that they can live in comfortably and invite their friends. So let's talk about the pros that we need to collaborate with architects and design professionals, because they're responsible for the accessibility where we can move in, out, through the home for function and safety. That is the architect and design professional's um, area of strength. Our next professional is going to be our design professionals and our contractors. How well the individuals perceive and accept that value home design and products that create that healthy home. So these are the people responsible for creating the designs and the appropriate use of them. And last, we also want to make sure that we bring in our occupational and physical therapists, especially these people are looking to seek you out. So if you're not familiar with your local occupational and physical therapist, there is an association for that. It's called AOTA. And you want to get with those professionals because those are the people that are being called and contacted by human services at hospitals when they get discharged from a hospital. And there is all of a sudden a need for a ramp, a need for immediate accommodations that need to be made to a residence. And these people are seeking out professionals just like you to help not only make that home safe, because they can do that, but they want you to help make it beautiful and safe. So know that these people are out there seeking you, the person, the specifier out right now. And you want somebody like that to be part of your team because the last thing that you ever wanna be accused of is practicing medicine without a license. These people have, it's, if you know that your client has medical or cognitive issues, you should absolutely be bringing in an OT or a PT because again, we don't want that responsibility to be on the design professional. Bring in that medical professional so that the proper responsibilities and the best recommendations are being made by the people with that experience and certification in our industry. Moving on to design products and ideas that I hope will absolutely change how you design homes, not only today, but for tomorrow. So can you sell independence and dignity? Mm, I don't know. Today, no one really wants to move into assisted living facilities. We all have bad memories of the recent COVID lockdowns. And furthermore, most people want to stay in their own home as long as they can. The most recent cost versus value living in place, accessible and safe bathroom model was listed in Remodeling Magazine and it cost 42,000 US dollars and the return on investment was listed as 56.7%. So with the average, with the current average cost of $6,500 per month for assisted living care, that payback is less than seven months. So you really are dividend reinvesting where that client wants it in their home, which is where they want to be. I, I beg you to ask anyone, you know, you're never going to see those people saying, you know, I can't really wait to get out of my house and into that assisted living facility. Yeah, said by no one ever. Independence and dignity can't be sold. We can't sell it, but we can tell stories that allow people to feel it on their own when they feel independent in their own home and therefore they can maintain their dignity because they aren't reliant on others. They can be more self-reliant. And if you speak to anyone, they always want to be self-reliant from that two-year-old that wants to feed themselves to that 72-year-old that's saying, no, I can do it myself. I don't need that in my bathroom or in my kitchen or in my house. Let's, let's get into some nitty gritty. Switches, electrical outlets, and thermostats. 
the National Electric Code does not actually specify a height for wall outlets. So why do we allow the electricians to always put them at 18 inches above the floor? Why do we do it? Because we don't think about it. That's the way they've always done it. And isn't that an evil phrase? That's the way we've always done it. We know we're not going to let people do that anymore. You, as more enlightened professionals, are maybe going to ask for them to be 24 inches above the floor. There's no need for someone to bend down to their ankles to plug in the vacuum. And we're going to make those wall switches 44 inches above the floor. Outlet covers are not colored or painted the color of the wall, so they are a little bit more conspicuous. I understand that in design we want to make them disappear, but that doesn't help people that may have vision challenges to be able to identify where those are, whether it's the person that owns their home or whether it's their guests, their friends, or their visitors. We know that in the average 100-year life cycle of a home, there's over 6,000 people flowing in and out of that living space. So consider power strips of extension cords if you can't install a new outlet. Place it 24 inches above the floor. It could help anyone from a teenager with vertigo to, um, to somebody that was older. So there's nobody that doesn't win with a lot of these. It's a win-win situation and in that regard, almost a no-brainer. We always recommend now from the Living in Place Institute, a GFCI outlet behind the toilet. Tell them the story. Oh, it's for a nightlight. It's for your visitors. Um, tell them that it's for the Alexa device that they want to plug in um, and talk to her while they're in the tub. Or heaven forbid they should slip and fall, they could call out to Alexa for help and call a relative or call 911, any of those things. But what they really don't realize is that if you don't have that outlet for the toilet, you never get the luxury of potentially having a personal hygiene seat in your bathroom, which we all know during the toilet paper shortage of the pandemic is absolutely wonderful. So many people went to bidets that there became a shortage of those also because there was a run on them because people decided, oh, well, you know, we don't have to worry about the toilet paper if we have a bidet seat and we can wash instead of wipe. Smart technology in the home is taking over. Leak detectors, AC adapters for smart speakers, outlets near the tops and bottoms of a stairway for either platform lifts or those chairs that ride up there, or just night lights to be able to light the stairs. And it's actually lighting that surface of the stair tread to identify its location rather than actually having someone um, have a light shining in their eyes and then not be able to see that. So if you take a look at this photograph, these are all from the Living in Place home, which is owned by LaDonna Erickson. This house is in Omaha, Nebraska, and there is a full video on this house. If you're interested, you can look it up. It's on YouTube. And this entire home is a Living in Place home with all of those things. And you would never know it because it's absolutely beautiful. Floor colors. Low contrast steps may be deceptive. What you can't tell is in this, in this uh, slide, there is a step right here. But because the floor colors are identical, it could be deceptive and present a significant fall hazard. Now, and I'm not saying that all contrast can be great. Some contrast can be bad. This contrast, um, the high contrast flooring will make that darker area appear to be lower or a change in height and very dark flooring in front of a door may make it appear as though there's an abyss and cognitively challenged individuals actually think that it, the floor drops off and it's actually used as a deterrent in the medical community for someone who may try to leave the premises. The trick is, is that they will put a dark mat at the door and that for that person that is cognitively challenged, it will present as a drop off and that person will not approach that. But contrast can be bad, contrast can also be good. Take a look at the gorgeous edges on those stairs that even through your peripheral vision, you can see, identify that's safer and everybody wins. 
we look at this beautiful contrasting stripe on the shower that so many designers are doing now, it's wonderful. Keep doing it. And by the way, it should be about five feet up off the floor. But it helps keep balance because we also know that everybody that wears glasses don't wear their glasses in the shower. And it presents a balance issue if the walls are all the same color. So this horizon line is the same exact um, idea as looking out the window of the plane when you feel a little, a little unsettled in the plane because you can't really get your balance or you feel a little like vertigo-ish or a little nauseous. You need to look out the window so that you can get your focus, get grounded by looking at a horizon line. This horizontal stripe presents that same thing. It adds perspective of level and distance. Throw rugs, throw them away. If you can't fasten them down, they become nothing but trip hazards. They raise the height of, of flooring. Um, if you have to do it, make sure that it's got anti-slip backing. We don't want loose carpets. And try to use ramps to help people get up and over thresholds so we limit the steps. Shower controls. Where are most shower controls located? Well, typically, if we let the plumber put them in, they're right below the shower head. Why? Well, because it's easy for him, and that's the way he's always done it. Again, that awful phrase that doesn't allow for the evolution of good design. So why not install them near the entrance so that your client can judge the temperature or the water pressure by just reaching a hand in and not have to potentially get scalded by hot water trying to reach that control to add more cold to the mix. And consider having a grab bar nearby to allow one to hold on to it while they're adjusting the temperature and getting in and out of the shower. Grab bars are wonderful, especially when you move from wet to dry areas. Sometimes, especially with the temperature or the steam in the beautiful new steam showers, people can get dizzy or have vertigo and just need something to hold on to. And they no longer look ugly. Look at these beautiful shower bars. None of them look institutional any longer. And again, you don't have to worry about the institutional things because we are not bound by ADA in a residence, only a commercial or an industrial space. So I'm really specifically talking about residential spaces in this slide. Grab bar installation is so important. We talk about the integrity of that structure behind there, we don't know what's back there. Everybody goes, oh, go into the stud. But how do you know? No architect or engineer in their right mind is going to certify going into a stud because they can't open up the wall and look at the condition of the stud. I work in a lumber yard. My kitchen and bath design firm is part of a lumber company. I've watched truckloads of studs go out and not all of them are perfectly straight without knots, without twists, without racks. So they could be questionable behind the wall. And so Living in Place recommends that you use specialized toggles to be able to put these things in there and guarantee a specific weight grab off the wall. So use them for new or exposed construction. You can put blocking in if the walls are already open and you can certify it and take photographs of that so you know where that is before you put your finished wall treatments up. But please do not scroll screws into metal studs. That is a big no-no and those are only good for hanging drywall, not grab bars. Blocking will need to be put in if you are framing with metal studs. Now let's talk about child proofing because again we are talking about all ages. Elevated polycarbonate paneling is awesome because it keeps the visibility open and provides protection. Window guards, it's not just for people to for people that might break in, it's for children that might try to get out. Um, elevating those electrical outlets and switches helps by not allowing that waddler or toddler as easy access to that. And there are child proofers that are certified to be able to come and help you or be a part of your collaborative team. Autism spectrum disorder is something that people are hearing more and more about. 
So many times you hear about somebody that, quote, has a child on the spectrum or an Asperger's, even a very mild. So each room should have purposes and transition should be smooth, their boundaries be clear. Um, bring in that OT and PT, they will tell you things like that a child that is on the spectrum in a kitchen, if that child is to spend a lot of time with you in the kitchen, you will want a quieter, non-polished finish on your countertop because the glare of the reflection actually reads to an Asperger child as audible noise. So these are things that you wouldn't know if you haven't had to deal with this in your life, but you should know it as a design professional that is calling out materials and finishes for someone's space. Other ideas, closets and countertops. Again, build in these organization systems. Tell the story that this is just the way that design has evolved and that you are the professional. You're so grateful that they trust you, but this is how it's done now because we know as pros that all good design always evolves. Elevated items, drop down clothes rails that you see so often and motorized lifts, bathrooms, wall mounted toilets give more space underneath and an easier access for users that are in a wheelchair that can transfer. It also makes for easier cleaning and remote flushing mechanisms. So there's all kinds of wonderful things that happen with these ideas that if we incorporate them there they may be good for even more than the single idea that we've thought of a well-designed environment can take care of the needs and aspirations of all the individual residents we know how important lighting is but wall colors and appliance noise levels are something that should also be considered arrangement of your countertops how sturdy is it um, how the water flows out of the faucet can be in the, the difference between mealtime being a frustrating or a satisfying experience. And raised garden beds in the yard can provide good opportunities for people with sensory issues to touch and smell plants without having to bend. And it also eliminates balance issues. So there are so many good things about that raised garden bed. And here's a photograph of somebody enjoying that raised garden bed idea. It's easier to tend. Let's talk about some counter space. And we've pulled these um, from the National Kitchen and Bath Planning Guidelines by the NKBA. They are very accessible and easy to see there. About the landing space on your countertops, the cooktop, the minimum of 12 inches on one side and 15 on the other at the same height as the cooktop. Now, many people will lower their cooktop, which I am finding is beautiful as a person who is only five foot, well, two, if I can tease my hair up high enough, I'm really five, one and three quarters. I love the idea of a lowered cooktop. So when I'm cooking with larger pots, I can see inside the vessel and stir comfortably with a large spoon. Don't operate those things. Be underneath an operable window. Um, check the building codes before you do things like that. It's just so important. Make sure that there's landing space near the oven so that no one needs to carry something hot a distance to be able to put it down. A microwave at least 15 inches above, below, or adjacent to the handle side, have a counter there to land an idea. The sink should have 24 inches on one side, 18 on the other. And if two landing areas are present, take the longer space and add 12 inches. So all good things from our friends at the NKBA. Appliance controls need to be large and easy to see. Um, here's a story, feel free to tell it if, it need, if you need to or it can help you or your client. I had a client who was just dying for a specific luxury brand of appliance. And this was probably about 10, 15 years ago. And she wanted this brand of oven and had been waiting and waiting and waiting for this brand of oven. It's a high-end luxury brand that we all know and are familiar with. And the control panel spun so that the controls were hidden when not in use. The issue was is that she was vision challenged. And when that control panel spun around and was exposed, it wasn't light enough and there wasn't enough visual contrast. She couldn't read the controls. So unfortunately, where she had been dreaming of this one specific brand of appliance, we inevitably 
wound up using a different brand so that she could autonomously read the control panel. We don't ever want to have to have people reaching over appliances that can be dangerous, especially ovens and stoves. Someone tells you they want a microwave mounted above that cooktop, make sure you find out if they have children in the house and are those children going to be using that microwave. We do know that the first appliance in a kitchen that any child uses is the microwave. Look, mommy, daddy, sitter, grandma, grandpa, peep pop. I made you microwave popcorn and I did it all by myself. Cleaning cooktops. Induction is really, really growing in popularity. I couldn't be happier. Not that I don't also love the instant on and off of gas, but induction gives you the safest cooking surface because we know that it uses electromagnetism to cook, that it is easy to clean, and when not in use, can serve as a countertop. You cannot do that with a gas cooktop. You can't just open your refrigerator, take all your cold cuts out and throw it on your gas cooktop because it will not function like a countertop and you'll make a mess. Pull out shelves help bring the contents of the cabinets into the light so people can see them easier. And pull out shelves are much safer for moving items throughout the space, especially if somebody has a limited grip or hot items. Make sure that you pull out a lower shelf if you do happen to have a seated user in the kitchen. Contrasting edges on those countertops also help. If you're looking at this one right here on the right, that is an applied spray on metal edge to help make it easier to identify since there wasn't a whole lot of contrast between the countertop and the edge. So some of the things that we wanna ask ourselves about the sheen, which I touched on a little earlier is, does it reflect sunlight from the room lights or even the under counter lights? Because some people have difficulty with this and shiny objects. It can create a blinding after image. If you've got somebody with vision challenges and you put their under cabinet lights to give them that task lighting and then give them a glossy countertop. It can create a blinding after image that makes it very hard to see. So our suggestion at Living in Place Institute suggest matte, honed, or even leathered finishes. They're beautiful, they are luxe, and they create a quieter finish as you can see in that one down the bottom. Inside cabinets and drawers. Well, we are really getting better at lighting the outsides of our cabinets, but what we are not so good at yet is lighting the interiors. But I am pleased that so many people are putting drawers and things that make the contents come out into the light. But consider LEDs inside the cabinet with motion sensors so that the contents are lit. We have seen it at our trade shows when we go there and our manufacturers that make those inserts are showing them off by lighting the inside of the cabinet. And we know how fabulous it looks there. Why wouldn't we do our best to make that dark interior more inviting and accessible so that the client can see all the items that they are storing inside? Nobody loves lifting heavy plates into or out of wall cabinets, especially if you're vertically challenged like myself. So frequently used items should be between the nose and the knees, or as I put it, your eyes and your thighs. And wear on your thighs, because your thighs are a big space. Drop your hands to your side at the end of the fingertip. That's where your level is. That is your individual level of your eyes to thighs. If it's above your eyes, you have to stretch. If it is below your thighs, you have to bend. So you will minimize ergonomic energy expended in the kitchen by doing those daily chores. So consider some of these organizers that are interior items, not only to drive your sales, but to make sure that your clients are loving their space and staying in it as long as they want to and not as long as circumstances dictate. Hardware on those cabinets should be those C or D pulls and make sure that they have a nice open clearance so people don't feel that their fingers will be pinched or caught. We do want to stay away from hardware with finials. And why do we do that? 
we remind people that they are pocket grabbers. They will grab at your purse, your bags, your clothes, your pockets, your scarves, all of those things. So try to keep the ends of those nice and tapered. There's so many new beautiful faucet operations now that you can tell your client, of course we put in a touch faucet into your new kitchen. That's just the way all faucets are going. And now when your hands are disgusting, all you need to do is reach over with your forearm or your hot pot, which will also activate a touch faucet, and touch that faucet and your water will automatically be running. I am a little iffy on the wave faucets, um, probably because I have an Italian mother who you will never tell her that she can't turn on or off her faucet without touching it. She has um, osteo and rheumatoid arthritis and grabbing that handle off on the side is very painful for her. So my mother actually was grabbing a spatula a metal spatula and she was whacking her faucet on or off until of course I got her a touch faucet and she absolutely loves it. Wouldn't think of anything else. And because it was a retrofit, know that there are brands there that you do not have to hardwire. Several of them now come with battery packs so that the battery pack mounts under the sink. If you are running a battery pack, you maybe only have to change it out once every 12 to 15 months, so you are not under there on the regular. Single lever style faucets are easier to control. So again, you make things easier for somebody than any age, and the top one with the on off was designed that way so that dirty hands touch the bottom and clean hands touch the top. So they, again, trying to keep it as sanitary as we can, especially with that COVID lockdown and everybody was thinking, how do I make this even more sanitary? Door lever handles. If you're going to do lever handles, please get the kind that return like this middle one that have a return. So again, they don't grab your pockets, they don't grab your, your bags and um, a hand that doesn't have a really strong grip, whether it's a child or an older adult, doesn't slip off the edge. Interior passage door swings. Um, install doors to swing away from a room to allow for fast and easy entry. And I'm thinking of first floor powder rooms where all the guests go in and we all know that those spaces are typically on the smaller side. So just think about this. Think about a story where if your client is giving you an objection to this, you don't just have to say, well, I'm the professional and this is why I say so. Again, create a relatable story and tell your client, well, you know, if your friend goes into your powder room because they didn't feel well and they pass out and are now in a lump on the floor of your powder room, emergency services is cold, could potentially knock them senseless or create even more injury trying to gain access to that space to get to that individual. Once they realize, and they may never want to do it for themselves, but they will always do it for their friends and their family that will visit. Width and of entry and passage doors, 36 inch clear opening space. Now that's even past the stops are more functional for everyone and anything smaller is a challenge. If someone is fighting you on this, find out why they're giving you an objection to making that doorway open and don't tell them, oh, well, someday you may be in a wheelchair and you're gonna not wanna rip your knuckles to shreds by getting through that door. So maybe you wanna tell them, hey, picture yourself carrying sleeping grandchildren or sleeping children or how many of you shop with our, our own bags now because stores no longer provide them and how many bags are you gonna line up your arms so you have to make fewer trips to the car. Now that gives all of us a wider girth as we're traversing in and out of those doorways and hallways. You're gonna destroy your walls if your hallways are too small with all of those shopping bags even. So think about those things and tell the stories um, of a laundry basket, them carrying anything that having that wider space will make life wonderful. 
all of the hair, the hallways and stairways need to be wide enough for this. And again, recommend that minimum width at 42 to 48 and include handrails on both sides. Um, one of the more wonderful things I've seen done, oh, right here it is, is on the stairwell, take a look at how the lights have been incorporated underneath the treads and it has been rabbited out in the handrail to shine down the wall. Now you have to admit that is going to be probably the most well lit proper staircase that you can see with vision, with limited vision, with peripheral vision, so it gives you all the good things. And anyone would be safer on that stairway than a stairway that didn't have that lighting. All right, so not everybody can traverse a stairway. What about a walkway and a ramp? Well, ADA establishes ramps like this um, to be one for every 12 units of run. The VA recommends one to 12 or one to 20, but this is still a challenge for people that are in a wheelchair. It's less than that, it's one to 12 for a, a car. Now, why would you want somebody in a wheelchair to go up something that was even steeper than designed for something with a car and a motor? So living in place suggests a minimum of one to 20 so that you've got a, a, a more gentle slope so that people can go up that ramp themselves or that person that pushes that chair up that ramp is completely going to appreciate you better. But it's not so, it's easy to get them up the ramp. What about getting them into the residence? Use some effortless transition strips to get people in from one to the other. In the living in place home that you saw from LaDonna Erickson, she has zero clearance entryways. How did she do that? She lives in Omaha, Nebraska, home of tornadoes and things. How did she do that? Her door has a specific sweep that as the door closes, the sweep slowly drops down from the bottom of the door, creating that weather tight seal. So even with storms and hurricanes, she has still told me that she has nothing blowing in. And you know who loved it the best? The furniture movers. When they had to move all the furnishings in and out of the house, they didn't have any bumps to go up and over to get in or out of the house. Who wins with this? Everybody wins with this. Your furniture movers win, your wheelchair people win, your assistive device people win, little children win, adults win, your pets win because they don't have something to step and trip over. Everybody wins, so why not incorporate it on every job? Wheelchair ramps. Now this one is a temporary structure um, but a lot of people are coming out of a situation where they need this immediately. So this modular ramp system can be installed in just a few hours and they come in aluminum, steel or wood to be able to get accessibility to that space because people want to stay in their homes. And I can tell somebody, you can either buy that next new SUV or you can consider taking that $60,000 and turning it around and in your three-story home, put an elevator lift that runs by a vacuum and it stays in your home. It only takes up 39 round inches of diameter and it can go to all three of your floors and you need not ever take the stairs ever again your three-story house can become your forever home. Wooden ramps, also very common, more permanent and an affordable solution. With proper care, we know that that wood can last a long time and they can be modular, offering a, several layout options and fast installation. And for people who like and feel that look of wood around the house, they can feel very comfortable with that aesthetic in there. So let's talk about the walkways. This is again a picture of LaDonna and Mike Erickson's forever living in place home. Minimum walkway is 36 inches, but better at 48 when you can. Not all of us have the availability of limitless space, but when and if you do, please go 48. Cross slope across the ramp, no more than one by 48 and a running slope of no more than one into 20. Keep the free from debris and foliage, 
broom sweep finish on concrete is best so that you've got a little bit of texture there to reduce slips and falls, especially with weather. But we talked about those outlets at the stair lifts and how, why? Well, we know that we're gonna tell people we want them there right off the bat all the time to be able to light the stairway or put a light there or even decoration. But what we also aren't saying is that in the future, should they wish to put one of these stair lifts or even one of the power elevators that I talked about, that's not a problem to do in a residence anymore, but it's easier when the power is there and it is exponentially helpful to those companies that are looking to install that and create a quick, easy and low construction method for someone to be able to access multiple stories in what they want to be their forever home. Alrighty, and lastly, how to sell this job. When you're talking about this, your marketing and business components, identify what you do. And we already tell our clients, we're gonna do our very best for them, but let them know that you are bringing in your services and your team. There isn't a single client that would love to not only know that they're getting you, but they're getting your team. Talk about that buying process and analyze what you can charge for your products and services because you can utilize your knowledge of the things that make somebody's home a forever home for all ages. Use that to your advantage. That has marketability and make no mistake, People that are looking for this are willing to invest that in their home. They are willing to dividend reinvest. So how to not talk about this. So if you're using a grab bar with an integrated towel bar underneath instead of a towel bar, there's additional safety and these are readily available. A towel hanging from a grab bar could slip off if it was grabbed with the towel on it. Um, you just tell your client, we always use curbless showers. They are fashionable, they're beautiful, they're very on trend. They make the entry much easier for everyone from children to pets and eliminates that fall to tripping over that curb. Also remind them that they may have already changed a shower out because isn't that where it typically rots? If you get rot, that's where it rots out. So we're eliminating all of that. If it's that I don't want the water to come out of there, so I have to put that curb, well then put the linear drain system there. It works for everything else. It'll take the water away and won't allow the water to run out over the floor. The day seats allow one to maintain their dignity from an activity of daily living, which is toileting. They no longer necessarily have to have somebody help them with the push of a remote button, they can be washed and dried and can retain their own dignity and not have to have someone help them. That could be anything from somebody that went skiing and hurt their shoulder. You know what becomes a problem then? Proper toilet hygiene. And no one wants to feel like they're the smelly person. So this is how you fix it. And an easy night light is a lighted outlet cover as it leaves all the outlets open for your use. So it's wonderful to look at those new covers that are available that have the LED lights built right in. So this way somebody has use of all the outlets that they're used to having and they don't feel like they're taking one away to use as a night light. It can also be done in a very fashionable way. You all know how to do that. I'm not teaching you anything new in that regard, but I am talking about how you can tell the stories to create that autonomy, that independence, and that dignity for your client. All right, so let's review our objectives today because we are coming to the end of our hour. So did we understand the need for better designs and products? I certainly hope so. We talked about the differences between disabilities and aging. Yes, they are different, but they also work in tandem. We're gonna examine, we did examine the importance of collaborative teams. Again, no one can be the expert in everything, but we want our clients' homes to not only be beautiful, but accessible, healthy, and safe. 
we are going to dis we discussed designs and product ideas that I hope not only rock your world but your clients and of course you're going to tell them the stories about how this is the way that design has evolved and this is the way we do it now a hundred years ago we didn't put stoves in the kitchen they were in a scullery off the back of the house so we didn't burn the house down that's evolved too and it continues to evolve. And we talked about how to sell that job. So I'm really grateful to all of you and for your time today. If you have questions in chats, I hope that you'll put them in there. And this was done by Living in Place and you can access their website in livinginplace.institute. I would recommend to all in the professional design field to consider getting their certification and they do get to put that acronym after their name after they complete the 16-hour course and the examination. So thank you to all of you. Here is my personal information. This is my personal email address and my cell phone number for call or text or snide comments, whatever the need may be. But I want to thank our friends at 2020 for having me today. And I appreciate all of you for giving up this time to be able to talk with us about designing for independence and dignity without talking about it.